Welcome back to another edition of Revival Radio TV. We're talking about Hilton Sutton with Ron Yutzi. Hey, Ron, thanks for staying over. Thank you. Uh, I want to dive right back into this really fast because we left the last week's program talking about the understanding and having an awareness. And you really just, just started to dip into that. So I want to kind of, let's pick back up. If you didn't hear all the, the history of Hilton Sutton, go back and watch last week's show because I don't want to take the time on this one. But let's talk about, you You mentioned that Hilton Sutton had an awareness always of the Father. Explain that again. You know, he lived with a consciousness that God is with him. Jesus hears him. He would talk conversationally in prayer. If you even heard him pray, it didn't sound like a religious kind of a, uh, preacher prayer. It was a conversation of his awareness that I know he hears me right. when I talk to him. And even his consulting, when he'd say, let's consult the father. And he would literally write there, father, and just talk, talk. Yeah. That was his way of praying. His understanding of the Bible, he would say to me, you don't have to be a scholar to understand this book. God's the author of it. He did not write it to be complicated. He didn't write it to be confusing. Those are tactics of the enemy. He wrote it to give light. Right. If you read it and allow God to speak to you, that's why it's living. You can read the same scripture verse and over a period of 30, 40, 50, 60 years, more light can come and enhance your understanding. Just allow God place to do that. You don't have to struggle and wrestle. He wants you to know him better than you want to know him. So uh, I think you're setting a lot of people free right now. And we're, and you said struggling, we don't have to struggle and wrestle. Cause you know, there, I remember as a young man trying to read the Bible and I'm like, I'm lost. I don't get it. Uh, you know, it, I was so thrilled when the living Bible came out cause it was <laughs> something, <laughs> something easier to understand. But how do we, how, is there a way we should prepare to study the Bible? I mean, to really dive into it. For an awareness, how do we how do we do that? You don't, I, Gene. I'm going to do the best I know how to answer because I'd say to anyone watching, we all go through that. You know, we all sit down. Even I mean, I've been a Christian now for well over 40 years, and I think, okay, I still read things and go, Lord, I could use a little help here, but that's that's how I pray. It's that conversational. I know He's aware. He sees me reading. He knows I'm wrestling with it. And if I can just converse, Lord, help me to understand that Holy Spirit, which that yeah. my Dr. Sutton would say, Holy Spirit, you're my helper. Help me with this, please. Just in that voice that he had. So to answer your question in the humblest way I know how, I think because God's word is alive and because it is powerful, the scripture tells us, we are going to come to learn in the eons of time more of his unfolding grace. Well, that means whatever I think I know, even when I pass this life, is a fraction of what I'm going to know because wow. he's going to take the eons of time to reveal. So I would say, take the pressure off. God wants a relationship with us more than we want it with him. He wants intima intimacy with us more than we want it with him. If we're aware of that, and then when I read the Bible, if I run through something where it speaks to me, have a conversation, Lord, that really speaks to me. Like, how do I put that into my life? Could you show me? He will. It might not be at that moment. You could be driving in your vehicle. Something could happen. Boom. Although, ah, the light comes on. I think as a believer, struggling with saying, I don't know the Bible entirely. Nobody does. None of us. And I think if we put it in a framework that we have to, it's a deceptive work of the enemy. Mm. We don't. It's intimacy. We're going to come to know. Whatever I know now, I want to know more. Right. And I would encourage anyone in their prayer life and in their reading, make it relational, yeah. not legalistic. I don't pray because I have to. I pray because I love somebody. I want to talk to them. I truly believe they're going to talk back to me. When I read the Bible, it's not because I have to. Somebody told me I have to. I'm reading it because the Father, the Lord, he wants to talk to me. Right. And he's going to use his word because it's alive. Mm. Yeah. That's good. Did see? 
it's take the pressure off yourself. Um, and I like what you said, just talk to him. And that's what you're saying Hilton Sutton was so good at, that he was aware. That's exactly, yeah. Like, talking to me, he didn't have a different tone than he would if he would talk to God. He didn't turn on his religious tone. No, no. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and, it, and it was, you know, in my early years, walking with him, I didn't see that. Because even among other great men, they had this posture or um, language or tone that would come out when they would pray. doesn't make it wrong. That's what I knew. But when I would see that in his life, that it was a just a casual conversation. And it didn't mean that he didn't have times alone where he prayed. He did. But it was truly the awareness that Jesus hears me. He's with me. God's word is alive. It's going to speak to me. And when I speak it, it's going to resonate. I don't always know how but I trust him. It's going to because it's living. So he would approach it that way. And that captured my life and helped me to know, wow. So even with the prophecies of the scripture, as difficult as I thought they were, I would look at them and again thinking, all right, one of the things he taught me, Ron, the word of God is alive. 30% of the Bible are prophecies of the scripture, including Jesus, Peter, Paul, they're alive the moment God said them. Mm. Just like a pregnant woman. She gets pregnant. She might not be aware right away. All of a sudden, there's signs. Then there's term. Then it comes through a season. It, that's exactly what happens in our life with God's word. It's alive. The seed gets sown. takes a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. It's working through your carnal mind, your way of thinking. Yeah. It's alive. It's growing. Let it grow. Let it have its time because there's going to come a time where the light's going to come on. You're going to go, oh, thank you, Lord, just that we're impatient. I want it right now. Yes, I do. I want it all right now. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, all right. How do we get your, and now I'm going to ask you another difficult question. Um, we're living in a time where there, especially with YouTube and social media and media bombarding us in all different ways. Uh, how do we know a true prophet versus a false prophet? I love your question. Um, I don't perceive it as difficult. It, it actually is, is going to excite me, so I'm, gonna, I'm sitting, so I'm going to Good. stay seated here. Hit us with it. Um, remember on the road to Emmaus, Jesus is walking with disciples. Now, these were people who knew Jesus. They heard him speak. They walked with him. He's walking on the road to Emmaus, and remember, they didn't recognize him. And on the road to Emmaus, he starts to unpack from Moses what the scriptures had said. They knew, even though they didn't recognize it was Jesus till he left, they said, did not our hearts burn within us when he shared with us the scriptures, which the scriptures he was sharing were prophetic scriptures from Moses on. How do we know? There are people who have good talks and they can move you intellectually. Sure. It can stir you intellectually. Hilton used to say this to me. The easiest people to deceive are intellectuals. Make it sound good. It's totally stupid compared to the Bible. Your heart knows different, but they'll buy it because it sounds smart and intellectual. One of the rises of the last days, knowledge. We, we, we're living in a day, Gene, where it's now they're telling us, they look back 50 years. They say this generation right now has more knowledge than at any point in time. They have access to YouTube, the internet, to art, things that we didn't have access to growing up. Right. They are more educated, but they do not comprehend what they know. Mm -hmm. 50 years ago, less educated, more comprehension. A true prophet, your heart burns. And it helps you to understand, I can comprehend this isn't just talking about things. And the other thing I would say is, does it point to Jesus? Because Jesus is the author of the prophetic gift. He gave them. If it points to them, if it points even to an event, Hilton used to say this to me often. It used to, he said, it drives me crazy, these prophetic teachers that are out there who say they are. They point to events and they scare people. That's not God. If you're using the scripture, it's alive. Right. It points to Jesus and it excites us about our assignment. It is a completely different spirit, totally different. 
How do you know? I think that we've got some even good people but are self-proclaimed prophets. It's an anointing. It only comes from the master, Jesus Christ. And when somebody opens up the prophecies of the scripture and begins to share them, hearts begin to burn. They're not just stirred intellectually to want to connect with, let me get that knowledge. Let me hear that thing. Their heart begins to burn. Burn with what? I want to get to know that Jesus better. I want to get to know God better. Like, yes, thank you. Thank you for helping me understand the prophecies. It's an event. But Jesus is the one that talked about that, or Isaiah talked about it, or Ezekiel talked about it. What does it mean today? It's the comprehension of what do I do now? I hope I answered your question. No, it's good. Well, you know, I think that's uh, that's really interesting what you said about the the easiest people to to get off track are the intellectuals because it appeals to their own intellectual nature, their uh, their which is really a pride. It's absolutely a, a sin right. of pride. Uh, so let's let's talk about the uh, where the nation is, where America is. And I know there are all countries watch us every week, but let's let's talk about America for just a moment. We're in a season of turmoil, and we've got a lot of things that are upsetting. A lot of things that that were prophesied were going a certain way that haven't either were wrong or they haven't happened yet. Or then we've got some false prophecy out there. And so it makes people want to just go, you know what? I'm just shutting it all down and, and I'll, I'll just wait and see. Mm-hmm. Is that a good thing to do or not? No. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. So the question becomes, if the information that you're hearing moves you to anxiety, either A, the information that's being shared may not have been shared with the right spirit or B, I haven't understood it. I may need a a, a deeper clarity. Because we look at America today, I mean, you go back 50 years ago when you're thinking about even farther, but I mean, if we just look 50 years ago, this whole thing that was moving through the 60s, late 60s, early 70s in America, you see so many similarities. And yet what happened? God showed up in amazing power. It is undeniable. And the scripture says that. Remember how it says after Jesus was risen from the dead, what happened? Acts 1, undeniable proofs of what? That he's alive. Undeniable. Now, somebody may want to dismiss it, but inside they know. Mm -mm. We saw this happen. So I would say to our viewing audience, to people, God is still up to something. When Jesus said he was going to build his church, that was a prophetic utterance. The word church was never used in the Bible. It was never talked about. They didn't even know what a church was. The building of the church didn't exist until after Jesus rose from the dead. It was a prophetic utterance. He's doing it today. As long as the church, his body is still here, he is fulfilling that prophecy. He's building it. For what? For the day we're living in. Undeniable proofs that there's a living Christ. That even though there's social unrest, there's racial tensions, there's unrest in other nations, there's war, there's inflation, there's political divide like we've never seen in the history of America. And yet in the midst of it, what's going to happen? Jesus Christ is going to show up, but he's going to do it through his body. And he may do it like he did in the back in the late 60s, early 70s with groups that you might not have thought, (laughs) but they were hungry. They were looking for something, but in the wrong places. And all of a sudden Jesus shows up and what do they do? They got a hunger for the word one way. It's all about Jesus. I think today We've got to get back to some of those roots that it's got to all be about Jesus Christ, what his word says. And no, we have been nestled and positioned at this time as the body of Christ. God knows all of this is going on in our country, but he's not done with America. He is not done with his church. He is going to show himself alive and show himself strong in undeniable ways. I think we need to be prepared for that and move from a spirit of fear to a spirit of expectation. That's good. Well, that right there is worth watching the whole program for. Uh, Let's talk about the younger generation because uh, people my age will will watch things happen on YouTube or social media and you're going, I don't get it. (laughs) Why are they doing this? Or where did this thinking come from? Or they're rioting in the streets and it's uh, Black Lives Matter, but it's all white kids. You know, you know, you're trying to wrap your brain. It doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And this generation really has not had the experience of a Dr. Hilton Sutton in their life. What do you say to that group? 
it comes down to reference point. What's your reference point? If YouTube's your reference point, if a culture that you were raised in is your reference point, the Bible does have a voice to speak to it. It does. And when the Bible becomes your reference point, let's just use the Black Lives Matter. It wouldn't matter any race, no matter what it was. If you said they all matter, that's the truth. They all matter. God made them. But Jesus warned us that one of the signs of the last days, nation would rise against nation. Interesting. We look at that and we say, Russia, America. No, that's kingdom king. No, 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 no. That word nation is the word ethnos. It means anything that is not Jewish. It's Gentile. We derive the word ethnic group from that word. What was Jesus telling us? Ethnic groups are going to rise against ethnic groups. God made them all, anytime, no matter what, white, black, Asian, Indian, no matter who they are. If you try to rise one of them as more important than another, you just fell into a category of racism and prejudice that Jesus prophesied. Reference point. What's your reference point? If it's the Bible, we recognize that another point. Let's go back just to ethnicity in itself. Paul's writing to numerous churches. He said, here's the deal, and he deals with it. It isn't about male or female. That's sex. And we see that today, sure. right? It's not about Jew or Gentile. That's race. It's not about bond or free. Ah, that's social. Yeah. What is it? If you're in Christ, you're family. We are all believers. What's the reference point? I think for all of us who are preachers, Christians, we better make sure that the Bible is our reference point and it speaks to the matters because many of these, these are very good people, but their reference point, the information they're gathering from is misguided. True. Well, and you mentioned the 60s and 70s and the Jesus movement. Those of us that are old enough to have lived through it uh, understand it, it, it seems silly today to talk about it, but it really was shocking to the American church to have these kids with long hair, you know, in 1968 was the year that everything changed. And so suddenly they're coming to church and they don't have shoes on and they're carrying their Bibles and talking about Jesus, man, and, you know, all of that. So it sounds wonderful right now <laughs> compared to what we're dealing with. But, I mean, back then that was a really big deal, yet only about 40% of those that came into the uh, kingdom during that time stayed mm -hmm. because the church didn't know what to do with them. That's a great point. You know, they didn't know how to handle it. It's like, you know, I've said this before, what would you do? If a group of uh, transgenders decides to come to your church, it's uncomfortable. We don't like that thought. We don't want to deal with that because, I mean, it's like, it makes us uncomfortable. Yes. Uh, but the truth is that's the generation we're talking to, and that's the big harvest that's in front of us. Yes. And I would say, you know, when I pastored in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, you know, one of the things that I heard from my dad, Hilton, and others was you have to minister with conviction, the Bible's alive, but you have to have compassion. And so what I would do is pastoring. I thought, all right, truly, if God can save me, a rock and roll guitar player that was strung out on drugs, if he can save me, which many that went through the Jesus movement had similar experiences, if that can happen, he can reach a prostitute. Sure. He can reach a gay person. He can reach a murderer. He can reach these people. The question becomes what you said, and it's even the more powerful question because it addresses the church. When he does, it's not going to be if, he's going to. When he does and they walk through your doors, what do you do with them? What do you do with them? My first time walking through the church door after I come to Christ, I still had hair down to here, chokers, chains. I remember somebody asking me, ah, you're one of those Jesus freaks. I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't know if they were mocking me. I didn't, I didn't know what it meant. Right. I, wh wh what does that mean? Yeah. Right? Some of these people, they don't know our terminology. Sure. They sure. don't, sure. right? They don't know it. So when they come in the door, what do we do? We must help educate them to their intimate relationship with Jesus because the change 
comes from the inside out. It doesn't come from the outside in. If you could do it from the outside in, we don't need Jesus. And that's the point, right? We have to let it breathe, give it life, because Jesus will show himself strong. But I think the church has to allow that kind of compassion. You referred to the Jesus movement. They didn't know what to do with the hippies. Well, if they don't feel welcome, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to leave. Yeah, go back out. Because they're going to go somewhere where at least they felt accepted. Or they get off into error on their own and mm-hmm. start preaching a lot of error stuff because they don't have that foundation. So as a church, so I know I got a lot of pastors watching. Thank you for watching. So this is the challenge to you today to be ready. They're coming. <laughs> They're coming to your church, and we're going to see what a great harvest, Ron, that's right in front of us. Yes. That we're about to see. Yes. Amos talked about a time where the reaper, you know, when you're sowing, but it's going to come so fast that you can't sow fast enough. The harvest just keeps coming. Jesus Christ loves people more than he does actual fruits like bananas and That harvest is going to come. We do need to prepare ourselves for it. He's going to show himself strong. So now the big question in the last few minutes, how do we prepare ourselves? I would say, and I I can only use myself. Sure. I can't, you know, to anyone else, if it helps them. How do you prepare yourself? I have to look at it through the lens of the blood of Jesus. That blood was shed to bring redemption to every human. Everyone I brush up against, everyone I come in contact with, whether I know them intimately or not, Jesus Christ shed his blood for them. Do I live consciously aware? Because what happens if in a conversation I find out, and I've had this happen to me, Gene, I didn't know, and all of a sudden somebody talks to me and they say, I'm embarrassed because I'm an addict. We can pray. You pray? Yeah. I've led prostitutes, addicts, people who were confused about their um, sexuality. Sure. Led them to Christ and then watch them grow. What opened them was I poured water on a flower, would open, open it. I didn't pour fire on something dry. I just wanted them to know Jesus definitely loves you. I may not even understand everything about where you've come from, but I do know somebody who gave his life for you and loves you, and with him, there is always hope for your future. We've got to prepare to look at people, look at our culture through the eyes of the blood of Jesus. Yes, God's word, but even preachers can be very condemnatory, very legalistic, very divisive, very prejudiced, and yet they use God's word. The blood of, take God's word, but we're talking about humans. We're talking about people. How do we prepare as leaders? We've gotta be able to look at people through the eyes of the blood of Jesus. That's our assignment. It is. The Ministry of Reconciliation. And that's uh, the, the key phrase that you said right there that stood out to me is, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to understand what they're going through. I just have to understand who Jesus is. Yes. Wow, that's good. So good. All right, so let's, let's wrap up talking about um, Hilton Sutton. What do you think his legacy is to this generation? I mean... You know, Hilton impacted his generation, but it went farther than that. It's impacted this generation. I know that there are people that may still read his books, search them online, um, but I would say the impact, as in any person's impact, live with a conviction. Be, Be true to yourself as a Christian. Live with the awareness that Jesus Christ is alive and until he calls me home, whenever that is, however it's gonna happen, I need to share his love and share his message. Hilton did that. I'm still one that I lived through that filter because I I watched it happen in front of my eyes and I know how it impacted me. There's many others that Hilton impacted by his teaching, but I know there's one thing he would like. Let it impact you with your assignment. Mm. Live for Jesus. Help others find Jesus and live for Jesus. Live for Jesus. It really sums it up, doesn't it? So... Take the, take the controllers off, uh, the condemnation off of what you're dealing with today. I'm going to ask you to pray again. Uh, take some time this morning and pray for the people that are dealing with all that you've said today. Father, I want to thank you right now 
we're having a conversation, Gene and I, and I sense your presence and your anointing. And I know that there's people that are watching this broadcast that their hearts were burning within them. There was an interest. There's something like a magnetic pull that is drawing them. Lord, if they're a minister, I pray for a genuine passion to continue to grow in them and a compassion like you have, Jesus, for people. Their message is important. Their ministry is important. Use them to impact this generation. And for those who are watching that have fallen into something where they go, I don't know if God would ever forgive me. I don't know if God could ever use me. I, I just don't you, don't, you don't understand what I've been through. Lord, I'm asking right now, you can move through this lens and you can move through their television, however they're watching or hearing this. Lord, arrest their heart and help them to know your love and that this is not an end. There's no burial here. It's a beginning. As they invite you in, change comes from the inside. So I pray, yes. call on Jesus and say, Jesus, I welcome you in. You're alive. I believe you're alive. I need you. I yield my life to you. And he will meet you there. Amen. Amen. Ron, how do people uh, follow you in your ministry? Uh, the ministry I have is Mary the Vision, M A R R Y the Vision dot com. Uh, they can go on. I do a weekly uh, video for pastors, for ministry leaders. Mary the Vision is all about the vision of Jesus. That's what it is. Is that Jesus gave a vision that he has before he left the earth. He said, win souls, make disciples, build the church. The church is to influence the world before the church is gone. Mary, the vision is helping pastors, churches, and their teams align with the vision that Jesus Christ gave them. Because when you're aligned with it, you will advance his cause and he shows up and does things you could never do yourself. So marythevision.com. All right, Ron, thank you so much for being here. I know you enjoyed uh, listening to Ron, the last two programs. Uh, go to his website, find out more about it, and go to our website, revivalradiotv.com. Make sure you check out the Revival History timeline there. It's unique to nowhere else can you get that timeline that you can on that website. So be a part of what God's doing. Be open, be ready, be receptive, and let's see a nation turn back to God. We'll see you next week. <laughs>